In this episode of Voice of the Sea, we're exploring the ocean floor with students and teachers as they go to sea virtually aboard the research vessel Kilo Moana. Even in this time of coronavirus, scientists and students continue their exploration of the abyssal plains, collecting some amazing organisms and learning about the deep sea food web with the remotely operated vehicle, Luukai. We're on board the Kilo Moana, gearing up to put the ROV Luukai into the water. Hey folks, this is Jeff. The main goal for today is simply to test the ROV system and to ensure that everything is fully functional so that when we dive tomorrow, that uh, we aren't encountering any technical problems with the system. ROVs really are an essential component to a deep sea sampling kit. Oceanographic institutions around the world that specialize in working in the deep sea, like UH, have systems like this. This, this is a real key tool. We are launching right now. They're taking down the safety gate behind the A-frame. People are getting into position and we're gonna put this thing over here in just a minute. Here we go, it's coming up off the deck. So the crane will pick it up. And the minute it comes off the deck, you have the potential for two tons of steel to be swinging around back and forth. Okay, so the safety gate is back up. You should be able to see uh, <laughs> blue water dropping down through the water. Can you see it now? Give me Not a thumbs yet. up. We're going to be going down to about 420 meters, so it should only take a few minutes to get down there. If you look at the video, they're testing one of the manipulator arms right now. So that's the arm on the starboard side. And uh, here we go, there's the arm on the port side. The arm on the port side has fewer articulations in it. It's not quite as dexterous as one on the other side. It takes a lot longer than you would think to perform a task with an ROV at the bottom of the ocean. We very much take for granted our binocular vision and our wonderfully dexterous hands. Someday they will simulate human hands rather than these more clumsy robotic appendages. This is the control room right here. So you've got multiple cameras. There are seven on the ROV. And in the control room, you've got a screen for each one. They're almost all on all the time. We're almost there, 100 meters to go. There's some garbage there. And in front of it, just in front and to the left, you can see a small fish with a long eel-like tail. That's a rat tail fish. You can see that when we touch down, it looks like a little bit of, of mud got kicked up off the seafloor. The sediments are really fine on the bottom. Can you guys see the lasers as well? So those are parallel to the camera. You can point a camera anywhere and those lasers are gonna be 10 centimeters apart. So they're like a ruler. So you can point at any object and you can get the size of them wherever they go. This is an undescribed species of sea urchin that actually has clams that live in its digestive tract. This is a small crustacean called an isopod. That's a sea cucumber. The string in the middle of it is the sediment in its gut because it's totally transparent. This is a piece of wood being grazed by a crab. It's eating the bacterial film on it. This is a sponge. If you can believe it, this sponge actually grows with branches. There we're collecting it, and that fish is called a blind cusk eel. It has eyes, but the eyes are buried in its head. They're not useful anymore. Are sea animals attracted to the ROV? Yeah, some of them are. There are certain squid that are attracted to the lights on the ROV. 
but there's also a lot of animals, particularly when you get deeper down, that see all the light and, and the noise as a giant predator and, and they go the other way. Typically what you see is that just on the, on the edge of your camera's vision, you see just tails of animals swimming off into the black. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. Welcome back. Before the Kila Moana headed out, researchers met with high school and undergraduate students working with University of Hawaii geologist, Dr. Bridget smith Conter. We're part of the EPIC program, which is Earth and Planets, EK and Kuleana. We are a group of 10 high school students and three teachers from the islands of Oahu and the big island of Hawaii. And we're joining today for a five-day online summer experience to learn about geosciences. Along with the EPIC students, a group of 13 undergraduates from across the U.S. joined our virtual cruise. Good morning. Aloha. Aloha. Good, Good morning. morning. Good afternoon, oh. <laughs> too. <laughs> These students were selected from a pool of 600 applicants and are working with Bridget in a summer-long research experience. It looks like everybody's here or joining, that's great. Both high school and undergraduates talked story and asked questions with expedition lead researchers, Dr. Jeff Drazen and Dr. Brian Pope. I'm a deep sea ecologist. I'm collecting the big animals on the seafloor. So I use the ROV as basically a safari tool. We go out and we collect these critters and then we look at the isotopic composition of their tissues. We have another scientist, his name is Dr. Craig Smith. He's a specialist on the animals that live in the mud themselves, small worms, crustaceans, things like that. So he's been helping us gather those samples. And we have another chemist from the University of South Carolina, Dr. Claudia Benitez Nelson. She is a, an expert in measuring the flux of particles. And so she uses some chemical techniques to measure how fast these particles are moving through the water column. So we know what the total delivery rate of the food is to the deep sea floor. My job on the cruise will be collecting particles of different sizes. What we will use is a, a number of battery operated pumps that we put over the side. They're programmed to turn on at a particular time. And there's filters in there. With each filter, there's a large filter on top, a smaller one and a smaller filter below it. And we'll get size fractionated particles. Are you guys bringing graduate students with you on the cruise? Yes, not as many as we'd like. Two postdocs. And four students. Normally we bring 14, but we can't because of COVID. So there are the eight of us that are the science party. There are 10 people who run the ROV, and then there are roughly 20 crew members. And those are the bridge staff, you know, the captain, the first, second, third mates, the uh, able-bodied seamen, the engineering staff that runs the engine room, the cooks for the galley. All done and told, we have close to 40 people on board. It's a big boat, guys. There's a library, there's a gym, there's a lounge, which we can't use this trip. Hi, I'm Andy. I'm from Kapolei. Do you have any specific like objectives or goals for like this trip? So the main goal for this cruise is to try to understand the sources of food to the seafloor ecosystem way down on what's called the abyssal plain. Half the surface of our planet is covered in two and a half to three miles of water. We still don't fully appreciate how food gets down there and how the animals manage to make a living all the way on the seafloor. My name is Maddie and I, um, I study geoscience 
at the University of Iowa. And my question was, how do you account for the differences in, in environment for the samples that you collect, like specifically the animals when you bring them up to the surface? So as far as like the sunlight and the pressure and how you store them? All of the animals are dead on arrival that we collect. Those animals still do come up largely intact, particularly when we catch them with an ROV, because it's quite a delicate way of, of capturing things. When we preserve them, we typically freeze tissues that are destined for uh, analysis of stable isotopes. And then the rest of the specimen, if it's large enough, is typically preserved in formaldehyde or alcohol, depending on what we want to do. What doesn't go in the freezer goes into a jar. Hello, my name is Elizabeth. I am go to the University of Alabama and I'm majoring marine science, physics, and biology. And I was wondering, for, you said you, how many of the species do you find, do you actually describe? And like, how long is the lag time? Or like, do you, if when you, the species that are described, do you, know, you still know you describe them or do you like outsource them to a bunch of other scientists? It, there's a big lag time. There's a lot of material that's been sitting on shelves for years that still hasn't been described. We typically outsource. I'm more an ecologist rather than a taxonomist. Many of the tech, not all, but many taxonomists work at museums, the American Museum of Natural History, the Smithsonian, etc. So I specialize in fishes. So I, I've got a network of people that if I collect something I think is new, I, I ship it off to them to, to verify. There, there aren't enough people doing taxonomy for the deep sea, for sure. My name is Rachel. I teach earth science and a bit of chemistry at Cabo Day Charter School. How are you educating um, our communities about what you folks do? There's a few different things. I go out and my students go out and we talk to classes and we actually bring specimens of animals with us. If you are in a, like a marine science or a science class and you were looking for a guest speaker, uh, please email me and it's a little harder now because of COVID, but We'd be very happy to come and meet with you and actually bring deep sea fish and other animals with us and, and show you what, what that habitat's like and what those organisms are like. How about um, <clears throat> Susie? Susie. Aloha. I'm a teacher from Radford High School. I wanted to find out how do we get on board. There are websites where you can volunteer for different cruises and different cruise opportunities. NOAA has a teacher at sea program. It's usually very limited numbers because we just don't have that many spots available for us. I run a summer program through, for university students and we try and bring high school students on board to go out for three days and explore the oceans. This year we can't do it, but um, in years to come, it'd be great to have some of you on board to get to experience this and get your sea legs for real. It involves getting used to being out at sea for a couple of days, but it's not too long in case you end up being nauseous. But. Um, if you're interested, let me know and I'll keep you informed as we move along. We are looking for a few heroes, mentors, trailblazers, innovators, a passion to change lives, spark curiosity, open hearts and awaken minds, help students answer the question, who am I? This could be your calling, but this is no job. It's the journey of a lifetime. Be a hero. Be a teacher. Welcome back. We're talking with navigator and data manager, Megan Putz, to learn more about the ROV Luukai and the team that operates it. While the ROV is going over the side and it's dropping down to the ocean floor, what is your job? My job is to be a navigator, which means I help coordinate movement of the ship and the ROV with the ROV pilot. So I'm basically the person telling everybody where to go and what to do. There are three main jobs in the control van. The first is the navigator, which does the work of coordinating movements of the ship and movements of the ROV. We have the pilot, which does the main flying of the vehicle, and then the manipulator operator, which picks up samples and does other things with the two manipulator arms that we have on the vehicle. Our pilot will settle down. The manipulator operator will start loading up the arms and will reach out 
and grab that animal as gently as possible. Our secondary arm opens our basket inside the basket and then the animal is placed inside. We also have other ways beside the arm to collect an animal and that's our suction sampler. The suction sampler is really kind of a neat and new tool that we have where it allows us to pick up extremely small or delicate animals with a gentle suction. And then that animal will be pulled through a tube into a basket in the back of our ROV. And that can be recovered after we land on deck. Previous to this cruise, we did not have a strong enough internet connection in order to be able to communicate with people on shore. While the ship was in shipyard, we got a whole new VSAT system, which allowed us strong enough and fast enough internet in order to communicate with you and students on shore and share with them the work that we were doing while we were at sea. Every time we dive, we always see something new or unexpected, and it's always like the first time. So I love that part of being able to do this work. Now that they're back from sea, we catch up with researchers Jeff Grayson and Brian Pope. We'll look at some highlights from their cruise, see what they discovered, and find out what's next. Hawaii has a wonderful natural advantage for studying the deep sea. A large portion of the deep sea is relatively flat plains. And those are called the abyssal plains, and they are at depths of about 3,000 meters to about 6,000 meters. And here in Hawaii, our plains right around the islands are, are right around four to 5,000 meters deep. And they're mostly covered in mud. The abyssal plains actually cover nearly half of the surface of our planet. The place we're studying, even though it looks really foreign and some of the animals look really bizarre, this is one of the biggest ecosystems on the planet. So the animals that we're sampling here are actually quite common. They're just foreign to us. So right here, we're taking samples from the ROV. This is the front. The other one we got was as well. Wow, look at that. That thing is huge. Okay. As soon as the ROV is secure on deck, we, we bring out these buckets of water that we've been keeping cold in, in the refrigerator and transfer all of the samples back into the lab. These right here are very large sea cucumbers that we collected off of the abyssal plains. They're, they're truly amazing animals. What strikes me is the size of the organisms that you're bringing up. So, so often when I talk with Brian, it's about these tiny, tiny particles that are floating or suspended, and it takes them a very, very long time to make it to the deep sea. And yet these organisms are, are pretty large. Yeah. Some of these animals, as you saw, are a couple feet long, and they have very fine tentacles around their mouth and they do pick up very, very fine particles off the bottom in mass and, and move them in, into their gut. So, you know, despite their size, some of these animals are, are sort of the bottom of this, uh, of this little food web. They're not all this large. There's animals that you can't see right now, but they're little worms and crustaceans that actually live in the mud. They also eat the same kinds of food. They may only be a few millimeters long. This is another one of those large sea cucumbers. Right there, we were just trying to get a weight on it. This is called Cycropodes. It's the one that has the sail that sticks up off of it. And that sea cucumber can use that sail to drift up into the water column and uh, find a new location if it doesn't like its current habitat. It's on its back right now. That's the mouth and all those little bumps in a circle around the mouth, those are all its tentacles, but they're all retracted back. You find a lot of rather watery animals in the deep sea. It's dark down there, so a lot of the predators that are after you are not uh, swimming really rapidly trying to chase you down because they can't see. There is bioluminescence, of course, but 
you can get away with having these these big flabby bodies. There's not much penalty. Right now they're cutting into the middle. Is that they're going to do the dissection to look at what it's been eating? Yeah. And if you look right in the middle, there's a brown loop. And that is, that's the intestines of, of this sea cucumber. And they're brown because they're just packed full of mud. The whole digestive tract is full of mud. The mud inside the gut is not the same as the mud on the seafloor. They select particular kinds of particles that have higher food content in them. And then Brian, can you explain to me how you're going to compare the mud in this gut of the sea cucumber to the mud that you're sampling with the ROV. Yeah, we've collected the the mud two different ways. One is just there, we're letting the animals collect it for us. And we're uh, dissecting the, the gut out of it. And we're gonna section that along the length of the body to get at the food that was just eaten and the food that's uh, been digested already. And we're gonna compare that with the mud taken in the sediment cores. And then the, the third comparison, of course, is the particles that we filtered with the large volume pumps that we deployed. That milk crate has uh, long tubes of mud, cores of mud that were taken from the ROV. They're taking those into the cold room to keep them fresh, and they're gonna slice them in layers. And we can look at the very top layer where all the particles rain down onto the bottom, and then we can actually look at the layers below and see how animals have mixed that material in. So I'm fascinated by these cores from the deep sea, this really kind of slimy looking mud. Can you describe to me what it was like? Did you get to feel it? What does it smell like? I don't know, maybe this would be like the mud you'd put on your face for a facial. It's, it's really fine. In the very surface layer, it's actually quite liquid. It doesn't have much of a smell. It's, it's not stinky, anoxic, swamp kind of mud. It, it's got oxygen through it, and, and so it uh, doesn't have any rotten egg smell or anything like that. Do you think that going forward in time, the technology that we added because of coronavirus will make the cruises more interactive and more maybe efficient? I think certainly more interactive. People who might not be able to go to sea, they always don't have enough bonks to bring everybody that wants to go. And it might enable people to really participate in some capacity. It's not the same thing as being there, but it is a really useful tool this was the first time that live broadcasts were done from the Kilo Moana because of the upgrade to the satellite connections. And the first time we were actually able to stream ROV video live from the abyssal seafloor. And, and that's amazing and it's wonderful. And it definitely will bring these habitats uh, much closer to a, to a lot of people, to the people of Hawaii and, and beyond. We look forward to connecting with students, teachers, and the community during future research cruises. Learn more at voiceofthesea.org. Follow us on social media at Voice of the Sea TV. Mahalo for watching Voice of the Sea. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.